There was a, once a beggar who lived near the king's palace and uh, the king invited everyone in the you know, realm to a big banquet. Now, the only requirement was you needed something to wear that would be considered royal clothing. Uh, the beg- beggar desperately wanted to attend, but only had some old beggar's rags. That was all he had to his name. And so he was really sad, dejected, bummed. But uh, he had an idea and he thought, why not give it a shot? So he went to try to seek audience of the king. And the king uh, gave him a clear green light to come and talk to him. So he stood before the throne, the beggar in his rags. And he said, oh, king, you're so gracious to invite us to the banquet, but these clothes are all I have. Um, do, do you have anything that I could, you know, do you have any idea how I could maybe come to the banquet? And the king graciously said, I will give you uh, the garments of my son, the prince. Uh, I'll give you some princely garments. Uh, and, um, you know, the guy thought, wow, the king would never help him. But when the king did, he was blown away at the king's graciousness and kindness. Um, and, you know, the, the, the beggar was given the princely robes and the king said, man, you can, you, can, you know, the, the guy was carrying his beggar clothes as he changed into the, the, the princely garments. And, and the king said, man, you can throw away, you can burn those garments, man. Uh, you, the, those are yours to keep. The princely garments are yours. And the guy said, thank you. And as he walked out, he just kind of held on to his stinky old beggar's rags. But uh, later the the feast, the food was brought to the courts and the beggar shows up in his princely garments, but he still had under his arm his old beggar's rags because you never know when you might need those again. Uh, And, you know, he he was carrying them and, you know, they're kind of cumbersome and and sort of smelly, in fact, really stinky. When he went to the banquet, man, he was going through the buffet and people were like, man, you know, this food smells so good, but what's that other smell, you know, kind of thing. And he was kind of trying to hide it away and with one arm sort of awkwardly trying to dish up some food from the banquet, but he was sort of struggling and, you know, just really kind of not, not really enjoying the evening because he was so busy trying to hang on to his old beggar's rags. Well, years passed, the banquet was over, but he was able to wear the princely garments. And like the king had said, he could keep the garments. And, and he also, the king also said, they'll never wear out. You know, they'll be good forever. But the guy just said, you never know when you need your old rags. And so, so there he just kind of kept them um, until finally years later on his deathbed, he lie there dying. Well, shockingly, the king came to visit him. And the king saw, there he was laying in his princely garments, uh, looked as good as new after years of wear. But over in the corner of the room there, there was the pile of old beggar's rags. And the king said, why, do you, why did you still carry those around? What, I told you to get rid of them. Um, and, and the king said, did you ever need them again? And the beggar said, no, I never, never needed them again. And with tears in his eyes, he, he and the king looked at the rags and they both wept because he didn't enjoy his years that he should have because he was so busy focusing on his rags. It's a little parable story. Are you like the beggar? Are, are, do you cling on to your old stinky habits, your ways, your rags, thinking you, you somehow might need that? I remember talking to a, a, a guy years ago, uh, AC Creeker, and man, the Lord was doing a great work in his life and, and he um, you know, had quit smoking marijuana. And, uh, and we were talking and, and uh, I remember how it came out and he, we were, I was kind of asking how he was doing and we were kind of praying and talking about some of this stuff and, he, and he, he looked a little guilty. I said, man, what's up? You know, he's like, you know, he's, I said, did you really get rid of all the marijuana? He says, well, yeah. I said, all of it? Um, and he said, well, he said, I, I just decided to keep one joint. It's, uh, you know, I call it my emergency joint. And he kept it like literally hidden on the mantle behind the clock, uh, you know, or something like that. It was like he literally had an emergency joint that he, that he stashed. Um, and I, I just, I felt like the beggar's rag story. Like you got to let that go. You don't, you don't need that anymore. The Lord has made you new. I love Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. But it says it beautifully in the you know, sort of the Old Testament uh, you know, kind of way. Isaiah said, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God for he hath, number one, clothed me with the garments of salvation. That's the princely garments. And also it goes on and says, and he hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. So we're the beggar, our old sin stinks. 
but we're robed in prince's clothes, the robes of righteousness the Lord's given to us. You know, we'll still mess up. We still make mistakes, but good news, the robe never runs out. It never wears out. Um, you know, that's why 2 Corinthians 5, 17 declares, you know, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, all things. Behold, all things be, uh, are become new. Um, you know, dumping the old rags is something you get to do. It's a get to and not a got to. Only sometimes we kind of think of, oh, I got to get rid of this or I got to get rid of that. But really the Lord's saying, no, I want you to have newness of life. I want you to, to experience the joy that comes from the new garments that you have. The, the, where do those garments get you? Uh, you can't come with your beggar's robes or clothes. You have to come with the newness of life. Well, um, we read here uh, in the story of John chapter four, kind of a beautiful picture of that, that we've got a woman who's probably not that uh, great of reputation. She's, she's a woman who's at the well at a time we learned on Sunday um, where she really uh, probably is an outcast of some kind because of the time of day she was at the well. We also know she had five husbands. Now, I don't know, did, did all of her husbands die? Maybe all five of them died. Um, and the one she was living with at the time was not her husband. So some people say maybe her husbands just died in war or battle or something, or maybe they just died of disease. And I'm saying, well, don't, whatever you do, don't marry her. Her record's not that healthy. You know, five guys in a row, kachunk, dead guys. But probably the idea is divorce, um, divorce. And, and the, the man that she was living with right now was not her husband at all. And that's actually just kind of a revealer. You know, you'll see websites talking about the woman at the well of Samaria. She was not a prostitute. She was not a woman of bad reputation. Um, I think they forgot about the part she's living with the guy right now. Because in our culture, that's like, oh, it's no big deal. People live together before they get married. Come on, Pastor Brett, get out of the stone age and realize the way it works, you know. No, I'm, I'm telling you, there used to be a time uh, a couple of weeks ago when... <laughs> People didn't live together before they were married. That was called sexual immorality or fornication. Uh, the Bible calls it that. Um, and our culture doesn't remember that sometimes. But this woman was doing sinful stuff, um, minimally. She, you know, five husbands, the one she was living with now is not her husband. Um, and then some say, well, maybe that just means she was a, a, you know, a woman of bad reputation minimally, but maybe even a prostitute. Others, have, you, we don't know for sure, but we do know she was a sinner. And guess what? Just like us. I just love this story. I'm not trying to harp on her sinfulness because I want to, you know, rub it in her face. I just love how gracious Jesus is to the sinner. And I love the way this woman responds to Jesus. And we, we looked at that on Sunday um, in depth, you know, the woman at the well. If you missed that study, I'd highly recommend it. It's, it's um, one of my favorite New Testament stories. I love the story of the woman at the well of Samaria. Um, so she left her old water pots, left her old water pots. That's how we finished the story last Sunday, is she left her water pots and went and told the city about Jesus. Uh, old, old things were passed away, all things become new. Um, it seems to me like the woman at the well, it's instantaneous. Did you notice that? She seems changed. And we're going to see in the rest of this chapter how her change seems to be obvious and maybe even evident to the people of the town. And we're gonna see uh, the Lord do a great work here in a very unlikely place. We went through the history of Samaria uh, on the weekend service um, and just Jesus being there was unlikely, let alone something good happening while Jesus was there, very unlikely. And yet we're gonna see how this is such a powerful story. So let's just, I, I can't avoid it. Let's just read the first part of this and then we'll keep going. I, I wanna, in case you missed it on Sunday, you can never read this too often. Verse one of chapter four. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. I like this just real quick. Um, you know, Jesus um, was not the one baptizing, but his disciples. Can you imagine if you were a person who could say, I was baptized by Jesus himself. Um, you know, it's funny how people are in churches and what have you. Uh, it's, it's a hard thing because, um, you know, people think that who you were baptized by can make some kind of a spiritual difference. Uh, the thing about baptism is you could be baptized by just about anyone who's a believer, um, especially, I think it is important to be baptized uh, 
it, it, with the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, some people say, I'm gonna get baptized by Uncle Bob in our backyard pool. Um, I, I think there's value in saying, I'm gonna be baptized by an agent of the church. You know, and, and who is that? I'm not into organized religion. Well, then you're not into what Jesus is. Or, Jesus loves organized religion. The Bible tells us that. The Bible teaches us organized religion includes deacons, elders, pastors, uh, even evangelists. Like there's roles the Lord ordains. Uh, it's God ordained. Now, I know that there's corruption in ministry, so people say, well, I'm not gonna do that because there's pastors that have sinned and stuff like that. If you're looking for someone to baptize you that's, that, um, that has, has not sinned, uh, then nobody in the planet has ever been baptized because Jesus didn't baptize people. It says it right here. Uh, people were baptized by sinner uh, disciples. In fact, these disciples were really sinful and wacko still. Um, does that nullify the baptism of the people that were baptized? Later, Paul would say, some people said, we're of Paul and we're of Apollo. Some said, oh, we're of Jesus only. It was all wacko. Uh, we're not supposed to be talking like that. Uh, we're, we're supposed to be Christians, part of the church, knowing that each, we're all flawed, leaders, pastors, uh, sinners. We're all sinners, but we're saved by grace through Jesus Christ. And we shouldn't be weird when it comes to the popularity contest. I almost wonder if that's why Jesus didn't baptize, because you didn't want to give people that, well, I was baptized by Jesus, uh, so your baptism isn't even worth anything, you know, uh, kind of interesting. Now, um, all that to say, uh, this, the, you know, here, uh, Jesus is going around doing this work, and he says, I must need go through Samaria. We talked about that on Sunday. Then verse 5, cometh he to a city of Samaria, uh, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there, Jesus Therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest, uh, wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Um, the, the mysterious language Jesus is using here, uh, it's a little hard with the King James, but he, he's not saying you, you missed your opportunity, if, if that's what you're thinking. He's sort of hinting that, man, all you need to do is ask, um, and you, you're going to have this if you want it. That's what he's saying. So verse 11, the woman said unto him, sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. The well is deep. From whence then hast thou the, that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sayest thou truly. And the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you say in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called, the, called Christ, when he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came the disciple, his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, what seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? 
And the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came in, uh, uh, came unto him. So the Samaritans, despised by the Jews, the woman uh, was also just, you know, despised by the Samaritans, it seems. You know, she was, uh, you know, married five times, living with a dude. Um, you know, it's interesting, by the way, culturally in those days, how there was a double standard, you know, for men and for women. Have you ever noticed, you know, in the Bible particularly, you know, um, the men of that woman, they, they probably were celebrated. Oh, wow. He's a player, man. Look at it. He's got a, you know, this girl and that girl. And, you know, it's funny how even in modern day culture, you know, um, we, we don't treat men and women the same. But in Bible times, it's amazing how a woman would be sort of an outcast when a man would be able to kind of keep his social standing and what have you. Um, I feel like that in our day today, we have similar discrepancies still between men and women. Um, they're just cultural things that are kind of wacko. Um, you know, uh, maybe, uh, you know, if, if you're a single, I know that um, singles in our church, I, I pray for our singles, man. To be a single person today is, uh, uh, is, is challenging, man. Uh, uh, and we, we see you. We know, we know that that's got to be challenging, those of us that are married, you know. But we, um, we also, I also kind of know that, it's, you know, if you're a man and you're single, it's one thing. But um, our culture sort of treats women differently that are single. Have you guys noticed that? And it's something that's kind of unfair uh, in our culture. You know, uh, if you're not married as a man and you're 40 or 50 years old or whatever, you're, you're esteemed like, good job, man, you held strong. You know, you hung in there, you know. Uh, but if you're, but in our culture, if you're a woman and you're 21, what's wrong with you? Like, it's like, uh, we're, we're kind of wacko. Um, or, you know, a divorced woman in our culture. Um, did you see this woman here? You know, she's probably been divorced five times. Um, that's one of the reasons she would have been an outcast in that culture. But the reason I say that is I love, one thing I love about Jesus among thousands of things, but whatever the cultural wackoness, which whether the time of the Samaritans or the time of Portlandians, um, the, Jesus sees through all that. Jesus is the one who understands all those discrepancies about the way people think about things and the way people treat men or women and what have you. Jesus sees that, knows that. Um, and, you know, Jesus wasn't worried about his reputation. Remember, he, you know, he made himself of no reputation. Um, but she's now just being, you know, like literally this woman is being probably used by the man she's living with. She's now drawing the water from the well. She's living with some guy and he, she's probably hauling his water. Um, but, but I love how while the rest of the world will abuse you and use you or think ill of you, Jesus comes and he absolutely cares about this woman. This is the kind of woman that culture would have said, eh, yeah, you're, you're, something's wrong with you. What a weirdo, you're an outcast. But Jesus is always the one who sees the person uh, and, uh, and, and through all the other cultural uh, you know, wrongness. Um, I love his compassion. He's not condemning even though he does call out her sin because she's got to get to a place of repentance, but he's not condemning, but he's loving and gracious. Uh, this is so good. We need to be more like Jesus in this one. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we just had the Holy Spirit just kind of correct all the little worldview idiosyncrasies that we have about men and women, race, or you know, social, <clears throat> social status, or wealth, or poverty. Like we, we all kind of built in with cultural, you know, uh, predispositions. And I'm going to say probably most of them are just totally whacked. Uh, we got to have eyes like Jesus to see, you know, people with his kind of eyes. Um, you notice the pattern, by the way, that we see here. Um, you know, one thing that the Lord does, especially Jesus, it seems like the Lord, you know, the pattern used by the Lord is from the bottom up. He finds the least among the people. He didn't find the mayor of Samaria or you know, Syker, this town where, where they're at. He doesn't find the mayor or the, you know, the head honcho or whatever. He finds the woman at the well. Jesus does that from the bottom up. He does that with his disciples, some stinky fishermen from Galilee. Those are his dudes. He didn't choose, you know, 12 members of the Sanhedrin to be his disciples. Um, Jesus seems to go from the bottom up. Human tendency says, we need to start, if you're gonna start a movement, man, get famous celebrities, get the big names, pay the big bucks, famous musicians, big names in politics, you know. Um, but, you know, some of the most powerful testimonies are from people the Lord pulled from the bottom up. 
and, and those testimonies are what uh, are really powerful. Um, you know, so Jesus is showing that no one is too far gone to be saved. We see that all throughout the Bible. We see that modeled here in the woman at the well of Samaria. If he can save the woman at the well, he can save you, which I love that. Uh, so Jesus turns being infamous into being invaluable. Uh, and we see her progression of, his, of her acceptance of Jesus. Uh, you know, she starts with you being a Jew. Uh, then she says, sir, 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 three times. And then she says, are you greater than our father Jacob? She's getting closer. And then she says, sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. She graduated from Jew to sir to prophet. And then she starts bringing up the Messiah. And then she says to the men of the city, is not this the Christ, the Messiah? Um, how, um, how, here's a question, have you ever wondered about this? How did the woman at the well in Samaria, how did she know about the Messiah and the Christ? Um, it's, it's funny, have you ever noticed that people that are really horrible sinners, sometimes they know their Bibles really well. Um, you know, uh, we've done some times where we've been downtown Portland sharing, and I'm always kind of amazed at the meth addict down there that's talking and, you know, uh, but you start talking the Bible with them, man, they've got like, they, they went to seminary. Like, uh, they, <laughs> you know, I've, I've known people down there and talked to people that are like very scholarly and know, know the Bible. It's kind of a funny thing. How does this woman know about the Messiah was coming? Um, she says in verse 25, she says, I know that Messiah uh, cometh, which is called the Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Like she knew something that was really true there. You gotta give the Samaritan woman kudos for just knowing that and, and actually looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. Um, even though she was in, this is, but listen to this, she was in a weird cult. Um, you know, I, one thing that I, I love about the Lord is if you really want to seek the Lord, you're going to find the Lord. I'm convinced of that. If a person truly wants to seek the Lord and is seeking after truth, um, you will find him. Even if you are misguided or taught wrongly, this woman was taught the weird Samaritan religion, which is a really weird religion. It was kind of paganism slash Judaism. We talked about that on Sunday. But how did she know about the Messiah? I have a hunch this poor woman who was living a life of sinfulness, she had kind of the hope of a Messiah. And how should, would she have known that? You know, the answer is kind of shocking if you think about it, because all the Samaritans had or believed in was, does anybody remember? Yes, yeah, somebody said it, the Pentateuch. Remember, we talked about that, that's all they had. It was even a tweaked version of the Pentateuch, but uh, that's what she had, that's what she probably grew up with. Um, so part Jewish, uh, part, you know, mixed blood of Assyrian, what have you. She had uh, some kind of a spiritual depth to her, even though she was a sinner. Um, you know, what's amazing to me is the spiritually deep people, the religious leaders would reject Jesus. The Samaritan woman figures out in like 10 minutes that he is the Messiah. Um, it, it's funny, the smartest guys religiously, spiritually, they didn't figure it out. They crucified him actually. That, that was their end result. But the Samaritan woman in like a 10 minute discussion finds out he's the Messiah and goes and tells the whole city. Um, the reason that's important is you might have a, a PhD or an MDiv or something, you know, you know, behind your letters, behind your name. But just because you're one of the smartest people in the room does not mean that that's just a guarantee to you knowing the truth. Um, you know, oftentimes you gotta become like a child. You gotta be simple. You might even need to be in a desperate situation before you'll actually have your eyes open to realize that Jesus is in fact the Messiah, the savior of the world. Well, this is where we pick up our story in verse 31. It says, um, in the mean a while, his disciples prayed him saying, master, eat. Remember the disciples just got back from Costco uh, with the grocery bags? Because uh, remember they were shopping and they see Jesus, ah, he's talking to a Samaritan woman. You tell him, I'm not gonna tell him. You tell him, I'm not gonna tell him. And Jesus finishes his business. The woman runs into town and the disciples said, man, Jesus, you need something to eat. Uh, I wonder if they were trying to rescue him from his predicament. Uh, even though he wasn't really in a predicament, he did everything willingly. But the disciples were like, uh, let's get Jesus out. You come over here, Jesus. Were they, were they handling Jesus here? Have some food, Jesus. I, I, I think maybe they were and I'll tell you why. It has to do with Jesus' response. Um, Jesus says, oh great, thanks for bringing the food, let's eat. He didn't say that. Um, he actually says something different that kind of implies maybe the disciples, maybe they're misguided and say, come on, let's go eat. Um, verse uh, verse uh, 32, 
But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore saith the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him aught to eat? <laughs> Verse 34, Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Now, boy, this is loaded. Uh, is he saying, uh, I am full because I was just doing the will of my father and talking to the Samaritan woman. You guys are wanting to get me away from that because you're nervous and awkward and you don't get that that's what the father in heaven wanted me to do. Um, but Jesus was simply doing um, what God the Father, you know, I always do the will of the Father, Jesus said, and that he was doing that. So, so this is a teaching moment for the disciples. Jesus is saying, you know, listen, uh, my meat is to do the will of my Father, and, and this is such a, a huge lesson. And, and man, those of you that are in ministry, maybe you've found that to be true as well. When you're serving the Lord, you know, there's something that feeds you. There's a feeding part of that. You know, it was George Whitfield that said, uh, I often am weary in the work, but I'm never weary of the work. Uh, and that's true. If you, you know, if you're a busy ministry worker, you know, Athey Creeker uh, staff, uh, we got quite a team here and I'm so thankful for our whole staff. They're a hardworking bunch. I think if you were to note, uh, there's, there's kind of a tendency in churches, I think sometimes to have kind of the country club mentality and people just standing around, just kind of doing ministry. And I've always been a little bit shocked at that, but I, I love my team here at Athey because we, you know, if you're gonna work at Athey, you kind of, it's, it's work, like people do it. But, but I think that our, our team here kind of recognizes that our meat is to do the will of the Father. And, and there's something that does kind of feed you when you're, you know, uh, busy. Like, for example, the prophecy update thing. I mean, here I call an audible because, you know, I ran of AIDS Israel. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big thing uh, to, to, to note. And, you know, um, when, when I mentioned that to our staff and said, hey, what do you guys think about doing, like, this is Sunday morning, you have to understand. Sunday morning, uh, after doing three services already, uh, I said, hey, what do you guys think about doing a seventh, seventh service uh, tonight, because we already, we did five services plus the Sunday night worship, and then the seventh would be Prophecy Update. Um, and, uh, and you know, if I didn't see my staff walking around, man, I got another service, you know, nobody did that. They're like, game on, let's go. Uh, like, I, I love that I have a team that is willing to pull stuff like that. You might say, well, big deal, just another story. When you're a church this size, being able to pull something like that off is a little bit, uh, you know, challenging. But um, I'm just so thankful that, and, and um, you know, um, I think part of that is doing the work that the Lord's called you to do. Um, there was a guy, um, a guy, uh, you know, from the 1800s, Philip Brooks, uh, an American Episcopal church clergyman before the Episcopal church went totally wacko. Um, uh, he said, seek your life's nourishment in your life's work. Um, and I like that. Uh, this guy, by the way, is probably most famous for writing the words to O Little Town of Bethlehem, the Christmas song. But, but, um, but he was a, an effective minister. But when they asked him, you know, how, because he was, he was so busy and he was, he was a guy that worked hard. Um, and they just, he just answered with that, that line, seek your life's nourishment in your life's work. And I think that's really what Jesus, you know, he's echoing what Jesus actually ultimately taught us. My meat my food, um, you know, the word meat there is not a ribeye steak as much as I would like it to be. Um, it says my meat or my food. Um, uh, you don't know, I, I have food that you don't even know about disciples. Yeah, but we got it from Costco. Where did you get the food, you know? And he says, my meat uh, is to do the will of him that sent me to finish the work. Um, so there's a question for you. Um, does the work that you do nourish you? There's an interesting question for you. Uh, uh, there is a difference, by the way, between your, your, um, your work and maybe your job. Uh, I wonder if there's a difference that you've recognized. Some of you, you know, your job is just work. There's nothing that's a blessing about it. And I commend you for, for doing that kind of work <clears throat> because <clears throat> if a man doesn't work, he doesn't what? Eat. Eat, that's what the Bible says. So that's kind of important. You gotta have a job for sure. But, um, but some of us are really, really blessed to have a work job that, that's also a job. Do you remember um, when Adam and Eve, what was the curse of man? What did he have to do? Work by the sweat of his brow. But did you know that Adam had a job before that? Uh, he was given a bunch of jobs. He, was, he gave a job to name the animals, uh, to, to subdue the earth. Um, he was also going to be the father and a husband. Like he had work to do. Um, but before the curse came, there was a job to do. 
But after the curse, the, the job, some of it became sort of work where, by the sweat of the brow. But I think as believers, some of us get to tap into that, that job that's uh, sort of the food that feeds us. Um, you know, this is kind of an important thing. Um, even though your job can be hard, it can still be a blessing. Um, and, and I would just say for some of you to reconsider if you've gone on a cor- you know, trajectory in your career or your life and there's no blessing and there's no food, you don't, you're not nourished by your job, there's a couple things you can do. One, quit your job, get something new. Um, I, I think a lot of people are afraid to do that. They shouldn't be. We have, by the way, speaking of that, we have a ton, we like 15 open positions at Athey Creek. Uh, yeah, Brett, it's because you work everybody too hard uh, there at Athey Creek. You just said it. We don't want to touch that job. Uh, no, if you're a hard worker, like we have, we have, we have some really good jobs here at Athey that are open. And I check our website for that. Um, but there is something, in my opinion, as a guy who's worked in ministry most of his life, there's something that feeds you in being able to do something that's eternal, something that's lasting, something that has to do with people getting saved, uh, ministry. There's, a, there's just, a, it's just such a blessing to be that. I count it a real blessing. Um, you know, the psalmist said in Psalm 40, verse eight, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. There's a delight. Um, so now we're going to see the Samaritan woman find fulfillment in what she's doing. Even as Jesus said, my beat is to do the will of the Father. Basically, Jesus is saying, what I just did, ministering to that Samaritan woman, the, the disciples would have thought, that's exhausting. I don't want anything to do with that, talking to a Samaritan woman. Um, but Jesus said, that's, that just fed me. I don't even need your food from Costco because I, I feel fed from ministering. Um, now we're going to see the woman uh, sort of be uh, blessed as she's gonna go and spread the good news of the gospel and spread the name of Jesus. We pick it up in verse 35. Jesus continues and says, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest? Behold, I say, lift up your eyes and look to the fields, look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor, other men labored, and you are entered into their labors. Um, Possibly an object lesson, you know, I wonder if there were fields that were, you know, being, you know, grown or harvests that were, you know, ready to, you know, be plucked up for, for, the, for the land. You know, um, there, there's those who plant the seed, till the soil, um, those that harvest, and Jesus is making a differentiation. You know, the planting, by the way, is kind of the hard work. Um, you know, planting the seed, watering, you know, weeding, uh, whatever, if you have a garden, you know, that, you know, that's sometimes the hard work. Harvesting's the fun part. Um, you know, picking the fruit of your labor and stuff, that gathering the fruit, there's profit and blessing, nourishment, um, you know, planting the seeds, you know, uh, I, I have to admit, sometimes I feel like I get to be the blessed, you know, har- part of the harvest that a lot of you guys have done all the heavy lifting. Um, you know, Resurrection Sunday, we had a ton of people come to Christ. And, and largely, I, th- I think that's because a lot of you invited your unsaved friends to church this, that, that weekend. And, um, and some of them probably reluctantly, I can only imagine, some of you had to kind of drag someone to church. Or maybe you were afraid, you know, what are they going to think going to, you know, Athey Creek with me on a Sunday? But I get to just, spare, you know, share the gospel. And, but you did the, the planting of the seed. And, you know, parents are also seed watering, you know, seed planting. Uh, and sometimes they don't always get to see the fruit of their labor until somebody else comes along and is part of the harvest. It's a funny thing how it works. But the one thing that we can do is Jesus said, if you, if you get it right, the one who planted and the one that's harvesting, you can rejoice together. Uh, as long as the good fruit is found. You know, someone might harvest, someone might plant, um, but uh, that's the work we're supposed to do. Um, and so, man, I hope you're doing that. I hope you're, you know, planting seeds with people you work with, neighbors that you have, people on your sports team in high school, or, you know, um, you know just planting seeds. You may not always get to see the harvest, but uh, for sure, the Lord blesses that. Um, can I just say, um, 
the Lord has been stirring our leadership team here more and more just in this, this you know, area that we live in the Pacific Northwest. It's, you know, Seattle, Portland continues to be, you know, spiking on the irreligious group that's going, you know, more and more people becoming irreligious and uh, people that are lost. And there's a darkness. Like, like, I don't know about you Portland people, but whenever, whenever you travel, have you noticed you can go almost anywhere else in the United States and it feels lighter spiritually than it does when you land in Portland. Portland, you, you land here and I always go, man, this is the beautiful, most beautiful place in the United States. I love the beauty around this place where we live, um, especially when the sun comes out like today. But there's a darkness. Uh, and I'm not wanting to be overly heebie-jeebie, but I'm just telling you, there's, there's, a, there's a large group of people that are just spiritually lost. And I think that, you know, that's why Debbie and I moved here with our kids uh, years ago, because we knew that Portland was one of the darkest cities, unchurched, irreligious uh, in America. In 1996, uh, Seattle and Portland were jockeying back and forth, the, the least church cities in America. And it continues to be like that. In fact, Portland's become the joke of the world. People, people have watched us, you know, and our mayor, our governor, I should say, just finally uh, said, okay, no more, this legalization of drugs is not working. So she's starting to work the other direction. And we were kind of, you know, shocked to actually see her do it. But it's like, we're all like, about time, because our state is falling apart and people are dying in our streets, literally dead bodies laying around. Um, I mean, it, 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 like our, our city has become a joke, but as, as Christians, you know, what are we doing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to a, such a lost city. And I think we need to sort of perhaps be willing to get our hands a little dirty and do a little work like Jesus. This will be the food that feeds us if we go out and do, you know, maybe the, the harder thing. Um, would you Wednesday nighters and folks watching online with us uh, be praying about it? Because we're, we're working on something kind of behind the scenes right now. I'm not gonna tell anybody yet. Um, but uh we are working on doing uh, an old school evangelistic crusade in downtown Portland. Um, big, like, like, you know, just inviting as many people as we possibly can to, uh, and just share the gospel, kind of like the old school. We don't see that as much anymore. You know, I miss Luis Palau. He, he knew how to preach the gospel. I miss Billy Graham. He knew how to preach the gospel. There's like one guy doing it, uh, you know, Greg Laurie's doing a wonderful, you know, Harvest Crusades and people are getting saved, you know, by the thousands and thousands. Um, uh, I, I'm kind of wondering like, where's everybody else that's supposed to do that? And then the Lord's kind of saying, well, what about Athey? Uh, why, don't, why don't we do something like that? And so we're just, we're working through that, praying about it, uh, but keep that in prayer. But in the meantime, plant some seeds, do some watering, share the gospel, and you'll find yourself filled and encouraged. And then when somebody gets saved, you can rejoice. Whether you did the planting or the harvesting, Jesus says, you know, you're gonna be blessed by that. Um, you know, do we, miss oppor do we miss opportunities to harvest? I think so. That, that's the thing that's troubling to me. I don't wanna be missing those opportunities. Um, you know, uh, interesting question is, is it sin to not do something that is good? You know, like we always think of sin as doing something that's bad. But what if the Lord wants you to do something, but you don't do it? Is that still sin? Yeah, because yeah, remember sin by, by definition is to miss the mark. If this is the mark uh, and you're not doing that, then that's, you're off the mark. I think that's still sin. That's why people get all upset when, Brett, you called us sinners. Like, you think? It's like, <laughs> like we're all horrible, miserable sinners for so many reasons. But when you start realizing what sin is, you should say, oh yeah, I guess we all really are horrible sinners. But good news Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He takes our sins and puts them away. But as a Christian, man, I don't wanna just keep, keep sinning, let grace abound and keep on sinning, God forbid. But one of those areas I think sometimes we can sin and not even really think of it as sin is when we're just disobedient and not doing what the Lord's called us to do. So the idea of, um, you, know, <laughs> you know, reaching out in our community, the, we're gonna see this woman, the woman at the well, do this and, and single-handedly, uh, well, I should say, you know, Jesus comes first, but, but then through the work of Jesus, this woman's gonna bring this, the gospel to the whole town. I love this. Uh, the story is told of a celebration of a New Orleans uh, pool uh, that would, had opened one summer and that went the whole year um, without one drowning. And so they had this big lifeguard party and convention, more than 100 people, uh, barbecue, pool party, uh, all, uh, there were more than 100 lifeguards at this party. Um, but after the party, you know, they started cleaning up and they realized there was something at the bottom of the pool and they realized one of the party people, uh, drowned and nobody was watching. <laughs> um, 
The person drowned surrounded by a lifeguard celebrating successful season, zero drownings. I kind of wonder if the church in America is like that. We got all these Christians celebrating and worshiping. Oh, we got the praise records and albums, our favorite this and that, and going to church, all this stuff. Meanwhile, there's people at the bottom of the pool. Uh, and the Lord's called us to be those who uh, are into you know, harvesting. Um, are we celebrating while people are drowning? That's a good question to ask us. Well, we pick it up again uh, and see the rest of the story, verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that I ever did. <laughs> I love this. Um, how were the people of Samaria saved? Because she told the hermeneutical dispensational principles or the eschatological perspectives of the pre-trib, pre-millennial uh, view? No, she didn't do any of that. Um, she told them everything she did. Jesus told him, like, like, I love the simplicity. It's, it's almost like ridiculous. Why, by, by the way, why was it such a big deal that Jesus told her everything that she ever did? Um, I don't know the full answer to this other than maybe she had a long list and everybody in town knew it. This guy told me everything I ever did. And they're like, you? They, she, the guy told you everything you've ever done. That's a long, like, it's a big list that she's unflurling. And Jesus told me everything. Uh, this was enough. Whatever that was, whatever her list of things that Jesus calls out, it was enough to where they all said, man, we got to see this guy. Um, now, to read into it a little bit, maybe it's, he told me everything I ever did. And yet, um, he spoke with me with kindness and compassion and mercy. I think that's also perhaps implied here. In spite of my sin, he was willing to talk to me. It wasn't just that Jesus knew everything about her. It's that Jesus knew everything about her, but was still gracious and loving toward her. Uh, I think that was the beautiful calm that came across this woman when she realized, wow, he's, he's nice to me, cares about me. So um, evangelism, modern, you know, modeled by the Samaritan woman, uh, what, is, what does evangelism look like for her? Um, I love the simplicity. Let me tell you what she didn't do first. She didn't say, oh, I'm forgiven. Now I have a lot of work to do. I gotta go clean up my act. I gotta fix all my problems. Um, I gotta tell all five of my husbands, I'm really sorry for dumping them and, and you know, cheating on them. Uh, uh, she's gotta find to gather all her illegitimate children or whatever running around. She didn't do that. She didn't repent more and do some penance. She didn't have to go off to Bible school to get a degree so that she could, get, she could go and tell the town about what happened to her. Um, she didn't have to gain some deep theological knowledge and understanding about the, you know, uh, the, the, you know, the theology or doctrine. Um, she didn't even have to sign up and go on the mission field somewhere in the world. Um, she didn't do a fundraiser. <laughs> what did this woman do? Um, what was her qualification that she could go and, and uh, be a, an instrument used by Jesus? Well, her qualifications are kind of nothing. She doesn't have any credentials other than she's a huge sinner and Jesus saved her. Um, you know, it, it reminds me of what Jesus said in John 15, 16, when he said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. Um, you know, qualifications, you may not know all the fancy theology and doctrine, but what you do have is your story um, that's why I love the song, Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. What a testimony. That was a testimony for that, you know, um, but, but, but it was also kind of our, our testimony. This, this woman, she was lost and now she's found. And so she's qualified to tell the people in town, check out this guy. She's pointing to Jesus, just like John the Baptist as we started the gospel of John. His whole thing was to point to Jesus. Um, you know, what happened when the woman went and told everybody about Jesus. This man, he, he knows everything I ever did. And yet he's really kind to me and he, he saved me. Check it out. Verse 40 continues. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And said to the woman, now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the savior of the world. 
You see, the thing that's cool about this is they're, they're, even the guys of the town are like, we're not even, you know, we're not believing it because of you. See, here's the problem. You and I think, well, I've got to convince people to believe. No, you've got to point people to Jesus. Jesus is the one, you know, that gets to, you know, convince people. Jesus is convincing. So she doesn't know what to say other than, man, look at this guy. Is not this the Christ? That's all she did. And they, they even acknowledged, we don't believe because of what you told us, lady. We're believing because we, you brought us out here and we met him. And, and, and notice what these Samaritans say. The Samaritans say, this is indeed the Christ, the savior of the world. Wow. Now, the reason I emphasize that part, um, you know, is, uh, you know, the, the biggest... The biggest part of evangelism is to bring people to Jesus. I love the invitations. Verse 29, come and see. That's an invitation. The man which told me everything I ever did. And then suddenly all these Samaritans come and see, and now they're all saved. And they're, they're saying, this is the Christ. This is the savior of the world. Um, now, um, the question is, why would the Samaritans believe so readily? Jesus would do miracles in Capernaum and yet people wouldn't believe. Like the, his own Jewish people <laughs> wouldn't believe. But isn't it funny, the Samaritans, they were willing to hear. And you know, there's, there's all kinds of examples of this in the Bible. Remember when Jonah went to Nineveh? Um, was Nineveh a receptive town to the, to the repentance of, to the God of Israel? Uh, they were probably the least Op optimal situation. If so bad was it, you know, the Ninevites, they were the same people that I was telling you about, the, the skinned people alive and all that stuff. The Assyrians, that was, the, that was who these people were, the scary bunch of people. And, and the Lord says, go to Nineveh. And Jonah says, I'm not going there. And pew, he takes off and runs. You remember the story, but he gets swallowed by a big fish and barfed on the beach and eventually has to go. So he finally goes to the city and he's like, he doesn't even want to be there. He's like, oh, okay, whatever. He's like, okay, everybody repent. And the whole city repents and turns to the Lord. Like, it's such a funny story. The least likely people in the Bible to ever be receptive to, to the truth was the Ninevites. And yet the whole city repents. In, in the same way, you'd almost say the, the least people in the, the gospel narrative should be the Samaritans. They hated the Jews. Jesus was a Jew. And he comes and just speaks with them. And all of a sudden they're like, this is the Christ. This is the Savior of the world. Meanwhile, all the religious leaders are rejecting him, despising him, and not believing in him. Um, this, is, this is interesting. The reason I point that out is, um, you know, we're going to see him in a bit go back to Galilee, to his own people, and we're going to see how they do. But I want you to remember, sometimes the more distant people are, the, they might just hear the gospel more readily than you might think. Uh, you know, sometimes the last people you might ever imagine to ever be open to the gospel of Jesus, you'd say, well, I'm not going to share the gospel with them because oh, they're not going to get saved. <laughs> I, I, I have a story that just kind of cracks me up because I, when I went to high school, you know, I went from a really small little red brick buildings, one room schoolhouse kind of vibe, uh, Applegate Elementary built in 1911. It was just a little red brick building with a bell at the top, similar, you know, very old, um, and it was very small, but I remember when I went to high school, suddenly I was in the big high school, you know, which wasn't that big, but compared to what I was used to, Hidden Valley High School as a freshman. And I remember one of my first classes uh, was mechanical drawing in my freshman year. And, and um, <laughs> I'm not gonna say the name, but my teacher had some uh, whiskey in his drawer in his desk right here. And he would always kind of go, <coughs> and then you'd hear, <coughs> and then we'd see him take swigs of his whiskey. And, um, and uh, my teachers at that time were, uh, that's a whole nother story, but, <laughs> but there was just one class and it was, I remember just kind of as a wide-eyed freshman in high school thinking, Wow, I'm in Sodom and Gomorrah. Because <laughs> um, this class, man, it was, they'd talk about horrible things and do bad things. And, but I remember this one guy who was kind of the ringleader. And I think he was like a, a junior or senior. You know, like when you're a freshman, you're like, oh, that's a senior or a junior. Uh, he was a little older than me. Um, but he also had this scar on his face uh, uh, stuff. I le later learned how he got that. It was, he, he used to go up and fishing in, the, in the, like Alaska and this guy, this, this drunk captain uh, chased him around the boat for a week and hooked him with a hook on his face. Anyway, um, it's a whole nother story. But this guy, uh, I liked this guy and, and all the guys, I, I tried to be friends with them, but man, it was, they were rough around the edges, you know what I mean? And, well, this guy's name was Jim Wright. 
And Jim Wright was, oh, was the, kind of the ringleader. I thought, man, that guy, whoo, he, yeah, it's kind of, you know, kind of, kind of intense, pretty much, you know. And I, but I remember just kind of, you know, thinking about that and then, and then went through high school. Several years later, I'm at church and, uh, and they're saying, hey, this guy's singing some songs. He's a really talented musician. He's doing songs out in the, in the service. And I was back with the kids ministry. And I said, well, who, who is it? They said, a guy named Jim Wright. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know there were two Jim Wrights. No, he's the guy that you went to high school with. And I'm like, eh, no, that's not who's out there. There's just no way. No, he's a Christian. No, he's not. That's what I said. I said, he is not a Christian. Uh, not the one, I, the one I went to school with. And I walked out there to see, and sure enough, there he was. I'm like, okay, how'd he get in here? Like, who let him in? <laughs> uh, but you know what happened was the Lord saved him, changed him radically, and uh, then he became a pastor. Uh, and, and now he's still pastoring a church. Like, it's amazing how the Lord can change people. Sometimes the more worldly and godless people are, the harder they fall for Christ. Um, don't forget that. Here's these Samaritans. It takes them like a, two days. Jesus spends two days in the city and the whole city starts believing he's gonna spend tons of time in Galilee and people are gonna reject him. What a shocker, but that's a good lesson for us. So now Jesus leaves Samaria and we change our scenery now back, back to Galilee because he makes his way from Jerusalem up through Samaria and now he goes back uh, up to Galilee. And we pick that up in verse 43. Um, it says, um, and now after two days, he departed thence and went into Galilee for Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Then, um, then when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went to the feast. Okay, so now we're back, you know, we're back in Galilee. Now, when you kind of look at the harmony of the gospels, what's that? It's, it's lining up all four gospels and putting the stories together to kind of figure out the nuances and what have you. Um, if you kind of look at the Matthew chapter four example, let me fill you in on a couple of things here. Why, uh, you know, we know why Jesus went from Samaria back to Galilee. We know his reasons why. Reason number one is because John the Baptist was cast into prison. We saw that um, um, you know, um, here, uh, but it's also in Matthew chapter four. Let me just put it up on the screen for time tonight. Matthew chapter four, um, verse 12 through 16. It says this. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, by the way, Nazareth is on the way. So he, he went, probably stopped by his old hometown um, and, then, and then made his, the rest of the way up to Galilee, uh, going north. And then verse 14 goes on, that it might be fulfilled. This is where it gets interesting. He's going up to Galilee, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, the land of Zebulon, the land of Naphtali or Naphtali, uh, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. Now you say, why are you showing this? Um, well, this is Jesus telling us why he went to Galilee again. And, and it was number one, reason number one, because John the Baptist was in prison. Uh, he went up there because leaving, you know, John's no longer there doing the work. So he goes back for that reason. But he also goes because it's a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah that light would be brought to beyond the Jordan and the Galilee of the Gentiles. Um, now, there's an interesting thing here that you should know. There's a, a phrase that you should know in the Bible, by the way of the sea. Um, that's an actual highway. That'd be like saying, um, that'd be like saying to us, the land of Zabulon and Naphtali by I-5, beyond San Diego or whatever. Like we know I-5 is a main corridor. Um, th this is actually a road by the way of the sea is the Old Testament um, name and, and New Testament name for a highway. <clears throat> now today it's, it's, a, it's known as an ancient road called the Via Morris. Um, and the Via Morris, let me just show you where it goes. It starts way down there in Egypt uh, and goes all the way up to Damascus in Syria. And this is sort of like the I-5 corridor. Uh, of that uh, region of the world. By the way of the sea, whenever you see that, that uh, phrase, it's talking about a highway that's very important. It comes into prophecy, Isaiah chapter nine, uh, verses one and two is what Jesus is referring to. 
But, but that's what's so interesting. Jesus went from Jerusalem and then he went up by the way of the sea. When, when it starts going off to an angle up toward the Galilee region, uh, Jesus was fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah, um, which is so cool, uh, the Via of Morris, an ancient road. It was a trade route through, and it went through Galilee, would go all the way around the coastline down to uh, Hierapolis and, and uh, Egypt area. You say, okay, well, what's the deal there? Well, it's just Jesus fulfilling another prophecy. I, I told you I'd try to bring up as many as I could. Remember my 300 prophecies that I was telling you about? Um, my, you go, I'll have them memorized, I'm sure, by now. Uh, more than 300 prophecies that Jesus would fulfill. This is pulling out one of them right here. Um, his ministry to begin in Galilee, Galilee, Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2, Matthew 4, 12 through 17, and then also our text here, John chapter 4, um, right here in verses 43 and 44. So pretty cool, uh, fulfilling the prophecy uh, of, of Isaiah. Well, uh, verse 45, uh, it says, then he went, it was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him, um, having, uh, uh, not as their savior, by the way, I wanna say, they received him like, okay, come on in, not as their savior, uh, having seen all the things that he did. Remember, miracles never produce uh, true faith, for they went into the feast. Well, um, so Jesus came again into the Cana of Galilee where he had made a, a water, uh, the water wine and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Okay, so Jesus went back to the land of Cana uh, where he did the miracle and he comes to this nobleman. Now, who is this nobleman? We don't really know. Kind of interesting. The word nobleman does mean something that's kind of intriguing. We use nobleman, like what is that? But the, um, the, the Greek word there is belisikos, which means uh, um, uh, of or belong to a king or kingly, subject to a king, befitting worthy of a king, royal, figuratively preeminent, dis, uh, distinguished. So whoever this guy is, he's kind of a big deal. And he comes up to Jesus uh, with someone, uh, you know, here it says his uh, son was sick. Well, verse 47, when he had heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. You know, he's asking quite a bit. This is a four hour journey for Jesus to go um, and minister to this guy's son and try to save him. But one of the things I wanted to show you is there's four stages in this man's faith that we're gonna see, this nobleman. There's four stages. And the first stage is what I'm gonna call crisis faith, crisis faith. Um, and oftentimes this is what happens to us. There in verses 47 through 49. In fact, verse 48, let's read on. It says, then said Jesus unto him, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The nobleman said unto him, sir, come down ere my son or my child die. Um, how many of, of us have heard, you know, stories um, where people had a, you know, a hurricane come through their town. Oh, we just thank Jesus. Suddenly everybody's talking like, you know, Christians, uh, you know, and everybody suddenly, because they're crisis uh, or there's about to be bad things. Somebody has cancer and it, it tends to move a person because of a crisis. And this is what this guy has. Sometimes the Lord might allow things to happen in our lives to get us to a state of, of uh, trusting and communicating with the Lord. Um, I see this a lot. Uh, remember after 9-11, the terror attack uh, that brought down the Twin Towers in New York City, people came back to, the, to churches for how long? Two weeks, uh, that's about how long. But it was a crisis in our country. And man, the churches were full in America for two weeks. It's, uh, crisis faith is an interesting one. The problem with crisis faith is sometimes it tends to fizzle out. Um, that's the problem. Uh, the different, uh, by the way, Remember in Matthew chapter eight, the centurion who was seeking for his servant to be healed. And the centurion says, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my foot, the roof of my house, but uh, speak the word only and my servant will be healed. That's like a le whole nother level of faith, the centurion. This guy's saying, come down here. So it is a little different kind of faith, but it's crisis faith that we're seeing. Um, and Jesus wasn't saying you know, this out of rebuke. And, you know, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Uh, but simply pointing out the condition of people's hearts, that they almost need something to believe. But this is gonna stretch the nobleman's faith that he's had. So he starts with crisis faith, but then we come to what I'm gonna say, confident faith. Uh, we see that in verse 50. 
It says, Jesus said to him, go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and he went his way. Ha, I love that. This is, this is Jesus giving this man an opportunity to have kind of the kind of faith without seeing. Because he, he, Jesus says, your son, he's good to go. And the guy's like, do you believe him at this point? Well, this guy does. It says it right here. The man believed the word. And I'm going to call that confident faith. The man believed that Jesus, what he said was true. And then I love it because he then has now confirmed faith, number three. Um, we start in verse 51. It says, and uh, as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him saying, thy son liveth. And now look at what this guy does in verse 52. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. Um, <laughs> verse 53, the first part. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, thy son liveth. <laughs> it's not like, when did he start feeling better? No, like he's better now. His fever just left him. Um, at, at what hour? At uh, the seventh hour. By the way, this is probably Roman time. Remember again, we were talking, you're getting our, our time thing figured out now as we're going through the gospel. The seventh hour, Roman time. Um, but here's where we see confirmed faith. By the way, if you ever feel like the Lord healed you, uh, don't think like going to the doctor for confirmation is a bad thing. Sometimes you'll see in Pentecostal or charismatic circles, we prayed for you, now just believe God. Yeah, but I've got stage four cancer. Yeah, I'm not gonna go see a doctor because I just know I'm saved and I'm, I'm healed. Um, you know what? That's not actually biblical. Remember the lepers that were cleansed? Jesus said, now go and show yourself to the priest. Confirmation. Um, you know, uh, I, I've seen people just kind of blow off, you know, the idea of having confirmed uh, what the Lord did maybe medically. Um, praying for healing is good and the Lord is able to heal. It's God's name, Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals our bodies. Um, but it's okay to have a doctor, you know, confirm. Uh, I remember, was it Evander Holyfield? Remember he had a condition and it was, I think it was Benny Hinn, maybe. Was it Benny Hinn that, that said, you're healed. And so he didn't go and see the doctor. And then it was a long story, but he wasn't actually healed. Um, and it was kind of this big, you know, scandal. But um, that's, that's something that's okay. It's okay. Uh, Jesus, Jesus had the lepers show themselves to the priest for confirmation. This guy confirmed, uh, when did this happen? At what time? Exactly the same hour. So you have crisis faith that turns into confident faith, that turns into confirmed faith, and then finally contagious faith. That's number uh, four on our list. It goes to verse 53, the last part, and himself believed and his whole house. Don't you love that? He believed, but also his whole house with him. And verse 54, this is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. So um, notice, uh, so now his whole household is saved. And by the way, uh, one thing about real faith is often it is contagious. Uh, don't ever underestimate the faith that you have as your heart swells and you just realize, wow, the Lord is good. Um, when you express that and, and, and speak that faith, the Lord, it, is, it rubs off on other people, which is such a cool thing. So um, notice it's Jesus' second miracle. The first miracle is the water into the wine. This means that Jesus, interesting, this is just curious to me. How many miracles did Jesus do in Samaria? None. And what, what, what did they end up doing? Believing. Um, we're gonna see that often in Galilee, there was not really that receptivity to believe. Isn't it something that the Samaritans didn't need some flashy miracle? Um, but the truth is the field is ripe with harvest and Jesus, he's seeing, he's already seeing. Now uh, the Samaritans are all getting saved um, and they're gonna be some of the ones that would pass, you know, um, you know the good news of the gospel. Um, I hope that, uh, that Athe Creekers, that, that the faith that we have would start to become more and more contagious, that people would be drawn to true faith not some you know, flashy thing or some shiny object. Nope, just real uh, faith that turns into contagious faith. Um, does the Lord want uh, to, uh, is, the, is the field still white with harvest? I believe it is. I think we're, we're, um, we're really called to, to go about uh, you know, sharing the good news and not hoard the gospel to ourselves. Let me finish with a little story that was once told, the story of old desert Pete. In the Nevada desert in the 
early 1900s, a long stretch of desert people would travel through, but there was a lone cabin, all dried up, dusty, cactuses and everything. Um, but there was a, there was a pump and the, the traveler came and, and the pump, you know, you'd crank it and just puffs of dust would come out. But next to the pump tied to the side was a baking soda can with a little note inside. The note said this, dear stranger, this pump is all right as of June 18th, 1932. I put a new sucker washer in it and it should last for quite a few years, but the leather washer dries out and the pump needs to be primed. Under the white rock, I buried a jar of water out of the sun and corked up. There's enough water to prime the pump, but if you drink some first, it won't work. Pour about one fourth of the water into the pump. Let it soak to wet the leather washer. Then pour the rest in medium fast and then start pumping hard. You'll get water, have faith. This well has never run dry. When you get enough water, fill up the bottle, bury it again where you got it for the next stranger that comes this way. Signed, Desert Pete. What do you do? There's a jar of water. Um, you know, you have to decide, do I drink it or do I prime the pump? And, you know, I, I think in some ways it's kind of like, um, you know, there's a lot of consumers in Christianity that like to drink, come and take in and enjoy what we do at church. And they drink of, of the fountain of living water, but we sort of forget to prime the pump and use the water, the word, to pour into other lives, other souls. Um, you know, remember Matthew chapter 10, verse 39, he that finds his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. So let's forget about our life and start thinking about the other people's lives. Forget our reputation, forget our social standing, forget our comforts even maybe, and start saying, we're gonna step out and we're gonna um, share the good news of Jesus to the whole world, amen? amen. Lord, give us a boldness, give, our, give us an ability to just let our light so shine before all men. Forgive us where we've just kind of done our own thing and, and not really saw the value of uh, just, or seen the value of, of, um, of just getting the gospel out. Show us as a church, corporately, show us as individual Athey Creekers, even the ones watching online in, in England and um, Africa and, uh, and in um, uh, Australia. Lord, the people that are watching in other places around the world, I pray that, that the light would just start to emanate brightly from this church and from all those that call on your name. Lord, we live in dark times and I pray that the good news would shine brightly today. Use us, give us wisdom and application tonight, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.